right now. Well, so welcome to the talk about the Freifunk Open Maximum PowerPoint Tracker. Uh, if you're confused right now, don't worry. It will be clear in a few minutes, I hope. All right. What it is is a small charge regulator up to 50 watts of solar power. It could be extended to more, but our design goal was to power small mesh nodes with autonomous power. It has some special features, like there is a serial communication implemented so the system can be monitored. So basically, it's a small solar charge controller and with a few special features, I'm going to explain them to you in more detail soon. Our initial motivation was that the refugee crisis uh, motivated some people to move to refugee homes and uh, try to give people access via Wi-Fi to communication that people, yes, they're looking for the relatives and organizing desperately need. And since a couple of years, I had the idea to build a solar with MTP function. This improves it. No, no, still lacking. Should I just try to carry on? Okay, so our idea was to build autonomous wireless mesh nodes for disaster situations. And uh, since I have been building solar charge regulators before, there is a feature called maximum power point tracking that increases the energy yield that you can get when you harvest power from the sun if you feed it into a battery. And uh, the image shows you the Freifunk mast that we designed for disaster situations like refugee camps. Okay, I'll That's a bad joke. Can I, can I have a microphone with a wire? I'm not, I don't mind. <laughs> no, just kidding. So, well, some application refugee camps resilient communication infrastructure networks in crisis and disaster situations, in developing countries, in informal settlements. Uh, there will be a version that I uh, develop in cooperation with the University of the Western Cape that also produces USB power, so you can charge your tablet or smartphone. Um, yes, one application is like community networks, like we are building in areas where you have obstructions in your so-called Fresnel zone. So there might be a hill or a mountain in between two locations that you would like to establish a connection with. And uh, you could put such a device on the hill as a relay station. And uh, well, we, we, we've designed it specifically for the purpose of monitoring a solar powered node and improving its efficiency, but you can also use it, of course, as a general purpose solar charger or whatever comes the way. Well, it's the simple block diagram. If you ever installed a solar system that's uh, familiar to you, on the left-hand side, we have the solar panel rated up to 50 watts. In the center, we have the controller. The battery, we use a 12 volt voltage regulated lead acid batteries, um, like they're common in in uh, uninterruptible power supplies and UPSs. Um, yeah, one important feature is you have to add a fuse because be careful when you install such a system, the current from the battery can burn the cables and uh, subsequently start a fire. So you always need a fuse close to the battery terminal that has the positive polarity and a router. I don't know if this picture is really brilliant here, but that's the backside of our portable mast. I, uh, yeah, this is one of the first prototypes. Um, the lights is from my in 
uh, my programmer to program the microcontroller. And it's, just, it's all assembled together with the solar panel. So two people can easily carry that and just uh, attach it to the mast and wire the, the power supply to the router. And then the system is more or less ready to go. That device has some special features that are different from what you could order from Alibaba or wherever you can buy solar charge regulators. It's an open hardware and open software design. You can program it on your own. The code is written in C. Uh, you can use AVR GCC as the development environment. And, well, at the bottom below I wrote that uh, you can program it with a, just with a serial command. That you, you just pipe the data for a new firmware into the device when you re restart it. So you can make your own software development. You don't need any special programmer, just a serial link to your laptop where you program it or from the router is also possible. It's enough to update the firmware. I worked with a open source CAD software. So you can use the sources that I've created with, another, with a free tool in case you wish to make modifications of the schematic and the board. The software is available for all kinds of operating systems. I used Linux for working with it, but you, it works on a Mac, it works on Windows. I mentioned it before, this, the design uses maximum PowerPoint tracking, abbreviated MPPPT, and I'm going to explain that in one of the next slides. What is special is that you can make data acquisition, like you can uh, read the status, like the input voltage from the solar module, the voltage of the battery that you're charging, and of course you can send the data over your mesh network to wherever you would like to monitor it, so you can keep track of the devices. You can also implement features or use features like uh, put the router to sleep at certain hours of the day, or the router can decide, okay, I have two interfaces, two wireless radios, and the power is getting scarce, so I disable one of two radios in order to have longer standby time, or I have nothing to do. It can tell the controller, hey, put me to sleep for two hours, and then wake me up again. For example, then you can have your router tell the network, hey, I'm going to be available in five minutes or in 10 minutes or in two hours. So if you want to re-establish the link, just tell me in two hours, I will be present. And this type of features you can implement on your own as the source code is available. My design goal was not only to have it accessible with regards to the software and the the sources of the CAD files. I also made the PCB design in such a way that you can build it in a workshop regardless where on the planet you are. If you have some skills in electronics, like you know how to hand solder and you're not scared of SMD, you can even make the boards yourself, including producing the PCB yourself. Like you only need PCB material and you have to etch one side. The other side is purely ground, and you have to have some uh, through-hole vias for um, cooling and uh, to interconnect both sides, but you can do all that in a shack with an electric drill and some etching fluid and the stuff that I use in my workshop to make them your, yourself, or you can use a milling machine that some makerspaces have. I had this idea because when I was in Bangladesh, I designed the omnidirectional antenna because there was a lack of those antennas. And after I left Bangladesh, I learned that the people there, they were carrying on producing those antennas and selling them for a very good price. So they had actually a source of income. And specifically, specifically I used only standard components. There is nothing, no special components by some special vendor. 
it's all very generic stuff that you, it's very easy to purchase. So if you have any access to a process of ordering electronic parts in the area where you live, you should be able to source all the components. Yes, and it has amazing one kilobyte of RAM and eight kilobyte of flash, and the current firmware only uses about 25% of it, even though there is a bootloader inside, which allows you to flash it very easily, and you can play around with it like with an Arduino, for example, but it's not the same IDE. You have to work with GCC. But some of you might have no problems with that. If you have any questions, please raise your hands and ask. No questions so far? So, uh, I've seen these uh, fuel gauge for lithium ion. I, I assume you could use this with a lithium ion type uh, battery as well as a 12 volt, right? Uh, well, for our project, we use uh, lead acid, like uh, the, the sealed type that you have in uninterruptible power supplies, I said that at the beginning. But uh, you can modify the code or the schematic. There is a hard coded voltage limit and the low voltage disconnect that stops the battery from getting discharged too low, you can program in the microcontroller. It's just setting one parameter in a define. So uh, I've been uh, looking into doing this for lithium ion, and I saw these um, things called fuel gauge chips, uh, LiPo fuel gauges. And I was wondering what kind of magic they do. Are they just monitoring voltage, or is there some, are they actually monitoring the charge going in and coming out? Um, and what are you doing in this system? Pro probably they don't. Um, if you use uh, lithium ion, then um, if you want to extend the lifetime of your lithium ion, you charge it up to 4 volts per cell, or 4.1 volt or 4.2 volts. Depending on the manufacturer, it's okay to go up to 4.2 volts. And um, then you stop discharging at 2.5 volts per cell, for example. So you have a voltage range of 2.5 to 4.2 volts. Um, if you're if you try to extend the lifetime of the batteries, like you can have 4,000 charge discharging cycles, if you stop discharging at 2.9 volt, and if you stop charging at 4.0 volt, uh, then you're essentially only using 80% of the capacity or 60% of the capacity, but you will have 4,000 charge discharge cycles, so it will last for a very long time. So you can use it for more than 10 years, given that you observe the temperature. Um, the, de the design also includes a connector for a temperature sensor, so you can also monitor the battery temperature. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe you already covered this uh, earlier in the talk, I came in a little late, but I was wondering how, um, like, let's say the scenario where you have a repeater on a hilltop, the example you gave. Sorry? How, uh, the scenario with a repeater on a hilltop, just for example, um, how generally, like, how big of a solar panel and battery would you need for that to work reliably on at night and on cloudy days as well? So well, it's sort of ballpark. For our hemisphere, northern Europe, or central to northern Europe in Berlin, um, I calculated that a 50 watt panel is enough to power a device that has an average consumption of 3.5 watts. So you can go lower if you take a very um, energy-saving device, like one of the small TP-Links that come with a USB supply. And uh, with some tricks, you can tune down the consumption to like one watt or less. And then it's also sufficient to have like a 20 watt panel in case you're looking for a very cheap wireless relay. Uh, I was using a mesh potato version two. It's like a, also sold as a Dragino V2 and it consumes three watts of power, so that's sufficient with a 50 watt panel. So depending on which type of device uh, you're going to use, you're going to use, need uh, less or more of solar energy, and of course it strongly depends on your geographic location. Uh, assuming that you can uh, mount the solar module at a place where you don't have shade during the day, and no obstructions that uh, stop it from receiving sunlight or yeah, any shade that you have on the module. More questions? 
<laughs> well, let me let me first in, introduce to to one of the great features that the device has. It is uh, using or it is implementing maximum PowerPoint tracking. Uh, just as a feedback, show me your hands if you know what maximum PowerPoint tracking for solar modules is. Okay, it's quite an amount of people. Um, so basically, um, in our design, I use a panel that is 50 watts, and it produces its max power at 25 volt cell temperature when it can produce 18 volts. So the specs are like at an irradiation of 1,000 watts per square meter and a cell temperature of 25 degrees. The module can produce its maximum power at 18 volts and 2.77 amperes. So now let's assume you, you take a 12 volt battery that has actually 12 volt when you charge it with a current of 2.77 amperes. Then what happens the voltage in the solar module, it drops down to the level of the battery. So when you measure the voltage at the output of the solar panel, you see 12 volts. And the current stays at around 2.77 amperes. Power in watts is voltage multiplied with current. So 18 volts multiplied with 2.77 amperes is 50 watts. But 12 volts multiplied with 2.77 amperes is 33.24 watts. So you have quite a large energy loss. You're losing about 30% of the energy. Any, any standard solar charging controller for small systems does operate in that fashion. It will just allow the voltage of the solar module to drop to the level of the battery. And an MPP controller, it takes the energy at the point where the module produces its maximum power and transforms it by the means of a so-called DC-DC buck converter to the level of the battery. And the result is that the charge current increases. It increases to more than 2.77 amperes, so you will charge with like 3.5 amperes, for example. And you get that extra energy by more efficiently using the solar module which is a feature that small solar charger controllers usually don't have. Only larger systems that cost in excess of $100 or euros usually have these features, and they're usually designed for larger systems, and the firmware, of course, is closed source. You cannot program it, and you, have all, you don't have all those features that we have here. Um, that's probably a little bit complicated explanation, so please, you're also helping other people if you didn't understand, if you ask questions. I had an ah moment. <laughs> I, just, I just had an ah an moment. Ah moment. Okay, that's yeah. a, so that's, thank that's, you. Thank that's you fine. very much. That's fine. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, um, one, one very tangential question is this um, higher current uh, in relationship to what you were describing before about the battery life, does putting more um, current to charge the battery, does it lower the lifetime of the battery? No. No. When, when you design such a solar system, uh, you have to observe uh, the maximum charge rating of the battery. For uh, lead acid batteries, you should not exceed the charge current that is 20% of the rated current of the battery. Like if you have a 20 amp hour battery, you should not exceed four amp amperes when charging it. Okay? So I use an 18 amp hour battery for a 50 volt panel in our project. Um, if you increase the charge current too much, the battery will suffer in lifetime. It's the same like, like with lithium iron batteries. If you charge them relatively slow, like with one-tenth of its rated capacity, they large, last much longer. Same is true for lead acid batteries. But uh, since you also want uh, a decent standby time and uh, back, back off time, for example, if there is absolutely no sun coming in because the sky is gray and so on, then uh, I have calculated that about for four days without any current coming in, when the battery is charged, the system will just carry on operating. 
And since there's always a little bit of current coming in anyway, if it's not covered by snow <laughs> or the panel taking away, then it should last for the whole year. And if not, you can apply current saving mechanisms like putting the device to sleep or disabling one out of two interfaces. More questions? I'm happy to answer. So, so as you mentioned, the, these uh, specs are all at one point uh, of basically the maximum capacity that, that the solar panel has. So on a cloudy day, these might change, right? Yes, they might change. But the, the voltage at max point, it stays pretty much the same over a large range of irradiation. As soon as you have 5% of irradiation, you have usually the full max point voltage, just the current is reduced. Wow, so it's in maximum power point tracking. Well, I have been designing uh, controllers like this earlier, but without microprocessor, just analog type. You can also buy some from Alibaba that work in that way. And it's, it's acceptable if you just tune it to a one, of one MPP point and keep, keep it like that. You will lose a few percent of energy, but that's mostly dependent on the temperature of the module. Well, actually, let's have some in-depth explanation if you're, if you're fine with that. There is a reason why the manufacturers of solar panels measure the capacity of the module or the power rating at 25 degrees and 1,000 watts irradiation per square meter. They take it and expose it to a device they call flasher. And the actual measurement process, it only takes a second or less. And they're cheating because if you expose the solar module to 1,000 watts of ir irradiation per square meter, it heats up considerably. Its temperature goes up to like 50, 60, 70 degrees, depending on the environment temperature. And at higher temperature, the MPP point, it goes down, it drops. So you have the situation that a solar module, when at cold climate and cold temperatures, its efficiency increases, and at hot temperatures, its efficiency decreases. So you only have the situation that you have 1,000 watts per square meter at very low temperature, like zero degrees or minus 10 degrees, on a, on a glacier, on a high mountain. Then, then you actually reach those, those ratings that they measure. So in, in real life, you will only get like 40 watts out of the solar module if it's hot in summer. And the microcontroller in the tracker takes care of that. It measures the idle voltage of the, of the solar module and calculates the tracking voltage out of it. Well, and uh, here's the result. Okay. So, um, just... I'll find, please. Uh, to complete the, the other part. Um, so regarding the current that is sent to the battery, there is no way to track how, like, like what I mean is that the maximum power point, you, you don't need to calculate that, but the board is calculating that for you. But, yes. the, but you have to dimension the battery in order to Yes. Not exceed that 20%? Yep. Or is there some way to calculate as well the, the current that is going to be? Well, you can also ca you can calculate the current. Like the current of a 50 watt panels at 20 volts or at 10 volts, you can just calculate it. Yeah? Power I divided by voltage equals current. I think the question was uh, if the module itself can make sure that you don't uh, put too much uh, ampere into the battery. Uh, it, it doesn't know the size of the battery. There is no... Um, and also, I, I skipped uh, current measurement when, uh, when I made this d development. Uh, the, first, the first generation of my prototypes, it was actually measuring the car current flowing into the battery because I used the so-called three-point algorithm like assuming a maximum power point, measuring the current, then assuming a higher value, a lower value, and measuring each time. But that process also costs energy. It's complicated to implement. So I, I dropped it all together in favor of a simpler solution that is also more efficient and takes less components to build. So I'm not actually measuring the current. I, um, I have some uh, 
last 15 years some uh, experiments on a boat, on a sailing boat, which I use now on three stage and four stages for a system like this, uh, for uh, uh, three routers, which make a center distribution point. Uh, problem which we found out if we don't have the charging power measurement, like you just said you, you uh, had in the first design, but this design does not have, is I, without the current to measure, we do not know uh, how much efficiency the solar cells has uh, in regards after sometimes there have been quite a lot of birds having shit in it. So, uh, yeah, the solar cell which we calculated, or which brought up for 50 watt, makes 15. So, if we don't know the current, we have no idea that somebody has to go up there five meters and to clean it, or get a bucket of water. If, so, how difficult it would be to implement, uh, again, the, the, uh, the current measurement? No, it's, that's, that's not difficult, it's just it's a little bit of extra effort. And uh, I'm probably going to make uh, different versions of the device, a luxury version with a cur current measurement in place. But for the functionality to work as an MPP tracker and be efficient, it's sufficient to not measure the current. Okay, it would be, I think it would be for us, uh, for a use case, would be more than nice to have the currents, which also gives an idea if the battery on the other side is not quite well working because if, uh, like gel batteries, they tend to dry out. Oh, if you, so, if you, if you so charge them at too high temperatures and with too yeah, high yeah, voltage. Yeah, they tend to, on some age, you know, to dry out so they don't take the current. I, I personally and operate batteries that are 20 years old. Believe it well, or not. Well, not, not quite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, AGM, AGM batteries are a little bit better in that case. Well, I, I have, uh, somebody gave me a used battery in 2001. It was several years old, and now it's 2017. I'm still using it. Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, well, okay I'm not our, our environment is a little bit I'm not bit living on a boat, yeah. but uh, yeah. with re regards to uh, dirt settling on the solar module, yeah. um, if I install such a system, I will mount a module relatively steep. So, for example, in summer, the optimal angle to mount it in summer is like, in our area, it's like 20 degrees. But at 20 degrees, dust and dirt, and bird poo, yeah. easily settles on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have 38 degrees in Greece. But, uh, but it's a problem because nobody goes up and looks at it. Pro the problem comes in, in wintertime when there is a scarcity of, of energy for coming yeah. from the sun and also snow. Like yeah. if you if you mount uh, the panel at like at an angle of 20 degrees, yeah. the snow it will just sit on there forever. Yeah. So it's better to mount it relatively steep and le lose a little bit of energy in summer, but the panel pretty much cleans itself. Yeah. So actually, I don't have to clean my solar module because I hate climbing on my roof to just yeah. clean yeah, my yeah. solar panel. Oh, okay, we we okay, but uh, that would be a nice feature if. Uh, you could have a remote well, current. Then center. there is the plus version that does just yeah, that, okay. but the Thank standard you. version doesn't need it. Okay, well, this is one of my first tests that I did with a very early prototype. On the left-hand side, you see the current measured coming in from the solar module, and uh, on the right side is the current that it goes into the battery. Um, I didn't, well, as, as you see, the, the current coming out is is greater than the current coming in, so the MPPT function works. So that's a, that's a look at the board. As I said, it's a board that you can actually etch yourself. If you know how to uh, expose such a board and uh, develop it and etch it, you can produce it in the tiniest shack on the world. So, and since it's standard components, it's easy, fairly easy to source them, as I said before. Uh, the building blocks of the devices are on the upper side, you have the controller part. That's where the intelligence is. That's the part that measures the input and output voltages, calculates the MPP. Uh, at the top, there is a serial interface that also has an in-service in programming interface. Uh, I use that to program the bootloader into the microcontroller, and you can do so as well. Um, there is another connection on top, this for the temperature sensor. So 
if you have a firmware that supports temperature sensing, you can measure the temperature of the battery. Usually you would have to assemble the temperature sensor attached to the battery so you can actually monitor the battery because you should not charge batteries at temperatures above 40 degrees. That's especially deadly for lithium ion. robust in the lithium ions. And the bottom, the lower part of it, is the DC-DC buck converter session. section. Excuse me. Uh, a buck converter works like this, if you're interested. Please tell me if, you get, if it's way over your head. The energy from the solar module is charging a capacitor. And then a high power trans transistor, it's a P-channel MOSFET, is chopping that voltage and feeds it into this coil. And every time this coil is charged with current, when the, when the switch closes, it builds a magnetic field. And at that magnetic field, it works as an impedance that slows down the current. At the same time, the energy is charged into the coil. Then the transistor switches off, and the coil discharges. And regardless if the, the transistor is switched on or off, in all cases, the output capacitor is charged. And this process is regulated by pulse width modulation. And all the other parts of the circuit are about measuring and calculating the pulse width modulation in order to, do, to control that process in such a way that the input voltage stays the calculated voltage for maximum power and that the output voltage that is used to charge the battery stays within the limits that are necessary to charge the battery. And then we have one more output port that's the port where you connect the load. So when the battery is discharged too much, the device will just cut the power to the output. It's a low voltage disconnect. And uh, controlling and protecting the battery against overcharge is also implemented in the device. This is just yeah, a feature that is, just comes with it. So it's nothing extra. All right. That's a big. Uh, that's a look at the schematic, but I don't want to kill you with that. <coughs> and uh, the quality is also not that great on that distance to actually see it. Uh, if you have questions about the electronics design, I'm also happy to answer them in a personal conversation over a beer or two. Um, all the sources are available on GitHub, freifunk-open-mppt. You have everything like the fuses, like how you uh, configure the microcontroller, the schematic and board design, the bootloader source code, the source code for the bootloader firmware, and so on and so on. Yeah, that's um, the KeyCut CAD software produces 3D fuse of the board. So I took that picture here. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy if you have more questions, also including your audience. Thank you very much. So, more questions. Why is the microphone not working? Eh? One question about the temperature sensor. Um, uh, uh, there's a uh, connector for the temperature sensor and uh, it needs to, just for my understanding, it needs to be at the at uh, solar panel? Uh, no, the temperature the, no. is, no, no. The temperature of the solar module is calculated by the microcontroller ah. from the idle voltage of the solar panel. Uh, you can extend, if you, if you know the ratings of your solar panel, you can actually feed that in the microcontroller program, so you can actually calculate the temperature of your solar module. So, it, so then you don't need a temperature sensor? You need a temperature sensor if you have batteries that are critical against charging when ah. the temperature of the battery is too hot. Because okay. the battery, 
Okay. Well, Kuala Lumpur is going to be hot as hell in in on a yeah. sunny day, but depending on where you keep the battery, you are in safe in a safe operating area. If you never exceed 40 degrees, no problem. But if you know, hey, this is a hot environment, and I can't protect the battery, for example, uh, against exposure to direct sunlight because it's in a box, and the box is exposed to direct sunlight, so it might heat very much, which you should avoid in general. But you can have this as a safety mechanism, which is critical for lithium ions because if you start charging them at above 40 degrees, they, you kill them. And it's a very expensive operation to kill lithium ions. So I still use uh, lead, lead acid batteries. Thank you. Sure. The usual suspects. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you have an idea what the components cost, like assuming I, I didn't have to pay for Of course, the I have an idea what the components cost. Like um, without the PCB and if I was making a Without the PCB, the components are like 12 to 15 bucks. Without a housing, of course. I have a question. Uh, how easy would it be to, to build this for higher voltage? For higher voltage? What wattage? Or for, for higher watts ratings. Yeah, yeah. For more power. Okay. Um, that's a great question. And, and another question also, what about higher voltage for using 24 volts? Okay. Well, the, the power rating of the system uh, at the moment, it depends on the size of the capacitors and the coil and the cooling. Uh, the cooling is given because I'm using the PCB as a cooler. There's no separate cooler. So if you, if you modify that section, you can make it for much higher power. And the controller can be used to control other DC-DC buck converters as well. So you can just use the upper section and replace the lower section or connected to an existing DC-DC buck converter that is high power. Uh, with regards to the input voltage, uh, some components are rated up to 36 volts. At the moment, that's the limit. Uh, the voltage regulator that provides the 3.3 volts for the microcontroller is rated at 36 volts, if I'm not mistaken. And the DC-DC controller chip is rated at 42 volts. So with some minor modifications, you can go higher with the voltage. But uh, in general, with solar modules, um, the larger modules that are used uh, for houses these days, they're usually rated around 30 volts. That would be beyond the limits because I designed it for 50 watt panels and they're usually of the 12 volt types, so they usually have 18 volts. But with some modifications, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say that 36 is a little bit too low for many solar panels. Yeah. But, yeah. Because of the idle voltage, if the if the open circuit voltage exceeds like it can exceed like 42 volt, and uh, that would be too much. If there's a little load, it, it will never reach that. But of course, the system has not been designed for that size. Like 50 watt panels, they are not 24 volts; they are 18 volts typical. But it's possible to use another voltage regulator, and well, the sky is the limit. You've got the schematics. You've got the sources. Um, and so, so, just may, maybe maybe I missed this part, but um, so the router is connected to the serial port. Uh, maybe it's not very well visible on uh, this uh, shot. Yeah. Okay. In the upper part. Here, up you have ten pins. Uh, six pins are for the in-system programmer, and. Uh, Three pins are for the serial port. It's a 3.3 volt level, so you can hook it up to any wireless router. But be careful, the device sends out serial data, and some bootloaders of your router, <laughs> they might, if they see, oh, there's data come in, somebody wants to flash me, and they might stop. No problem for TP-Link and many other devices that want something like TPL yeah. on the serial console, in order to stop the bootloader. But this is something that you need to observe the, when you choose the device. You can all, it's also possible, of course, to modify the firmware of the 
controller, so it only sends data on demand. So if you're ex is it, only if it explicitly asks for data, it can send out data. It's also possible. Okay, I was thinking more about the the power, like it powers the router. On, I don't uh, see. It. Okay, the the router is uh, powered via this port here. This one is uh, switched on and off. Okay. From the microcontroller. So so it's. So it implements like a low voltage disconnect? It is a low voltage yeah. disconnect. Okay. And uh, that's the same transistor like here. It's rated at 31 amperes. Of course, if you would charge 31 amperes or draw 31 amperes from it, it will heat up. But uh, with that cooling, it's good enough for 5, 6, 7, 8 amperes. I, I'm thinking that maybe the 24 volt idea could, could be simply implemented as uh, um, DC, DC, like keep the solar panel and the battery at 12 volts, but just send 24 volts to the router? Well, whenever possible, I avoid uh, using 24 volt uh, system voltage, because then you have two batteries in a row, and the more cells you have in a row, the more are your problems, because then one cell is weaker, and uh, if you have like 50 cells or 100 cells in a car, and they're all in a row, one of them is the weakest, that's the one to die out first. You also have the same problem with your batteries of your laptops. I often store lithium iron batteries, iron batteries from uh, old laptop batteries. It's like they have three cells in a row, and two of them are perfectly fine, and one is dead. Yeah. That's the usual problem when you dump them. That, that's why I, I just want to confirm that it would be kind of trivial to just send 24 volts to the router and keep yeah. everything. You, you only have to change some resistors and maybe the, uh, the voltage regulator that provides 3.3 volt, and then you can operate it at much higher voltage. And of course, uh, the capacitor is that one is uh, rated 35 volts, and that is 16 volts. It's certainly not going to survive 24 volts. The question, the question of heat, I believe, is can we keep the, the lab with the lab with 12 volts and the right part of the to, 20, to 24 volts? Yeah. Uh, no, that would that would require that you have that you change this configuration to a step up converter. Uh, at the moment, th this section is a step down converter, so it cannot increase 18 volts to higher voltage. No. but you can make that too. What I mean is keep uh, like use a solar power solar panel like it is right now, like 18, 18 volts. A battery at is ideal, and just have the power to the router converted up to 24, ah, to 24 volts. volts. I think that would yes, be of course. the best. Yes, of course. Uh, yes, if you, if you want to use like PoE with a low voltage drop, yeah. then uh, you can buy those modules in Germany for two to three euros. But, but it's like a uh, DC, DC converter that, that could be it's just a, one component. No, it's, there. It's, it's a tiny converter. You just connect it here and to ground. And uh, everything else stays the same. Uh, the microcontroller can still switch it on and off. And uh, you will have minimal losses, like uh, transforming with a DC-DC step-up converter from like 12 volts or 13 volts to 24. You will have an efficiency in excess of 95%. So it will be 98% efficient. So it's really not a big deal. So if you, if you want that for, for PoE, no, no problem. It's very low cost, and you don't have to change anything here. I think that would be definitely in, be interesting to have like the the uh, paths yes, for, for the Libre router because uh, we rated it 18 or 24 volts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But actually, um, if if you build such a system, you should not allow uh, to have very long cables uh, to power it because you will have some voltage drop anyway. With 24 volts, you can mitigate that problem. So, yes. But, um, for example, if it's, if it's on a pole, you can mount it to the pole, given that the, it's, the environment is not too hot for the battery. Thanks. Uh, maybe, maybe I misunderstood it, but you said that uh, if the power is too low, then the router is switched off. So um, if there's not it, enough it, power, it, then the system actively switches off the router? In the, source, in, in the source code of the microcontroller, one GPIO pin is controlled, and by putting that GPIO to high, that output is enabled. So you, 
At the, at the moment, there is two defines. One defines when you drop the load, and one defines when you enable the load. But you can do any, any, any other parameters in order to enable or disable the load. So uh, is it uh, thinkable that, uh, for instance, the router can say, uh, please switch me off and uh, wake me up in yeah, some I, hours again? I, that was, these were my words. I just uh, said it about 25 minutes ago. You, you, can, you. you, can, you can just... In the firmware, for example, you can have a feature like the, the router sends a request, stop me for 25 minutes. And uh, the system is, is uh, clocked by a crystal, so you have pretty accurate time. So with a very small deviation, you can say, in eight minutes, I'm, I'm going to be live again. Then I wait for a minute. If nothing happens, I go to sleep again. And so it will just tell the microcontroller again, put me to sleep for another eight minutes. But beware, don't run automated firmware updates. <laughs> That's going to be bad. Thank you. Just shortly coming back to uh, the power measurement. Uh, we found out uh, in uh, usage of MPP controllers and uh, energy management that uh, for us it was somehow important not only to measure the input power for charging the battery, but also what uh, we use from the battery. So uh, the you're outflow. talking about uh, the MPP tracker plus plus. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, so there's oh, MPP no, tracker. No, no. no. <laughs> I, I said the the problem because we used since a few years ago uh, the microcontrollers was it's not quite easy to measure. Uh, yeah, um, current. The current in one and the other direction. Oh, so oh, the 80 mega, uh, the 80 mega. I don't know if it's, if it's very, it's very easy. It has like eight analog to digital converters, so you can measure eight. Well, but that is reference to ground, is it? What? That is, the measurement of voltage is all always the reference to ground. Oh yes. So but we can't we can't do that if the voltage goes negative. Okay. There's already available current measurements modules that will send it over the I2C bus. Oh, oh, okay, okay, I see. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. But beware, all the current measurements that you do, it will also have some energy losses because you have a resistor that has to introduce a voltage drop and then so you, so you give up some power. Yeah, yeah, but uh, for us in the long haul, uh, it was important to see the efficiency of the storage. You know, so it was uh, they <coughs> for for some reasons. Well, well, of course, uh, you could you could measure the current that you charge into the battery, send the data to and the, the discharge in the night to the router, yeah. and then yeah. you can actually measure the, measure the capacity of your battery. Right, right. Yeah, you can uh, do that uh, too. For a long time. Thank you. Ha, so one more question. The last question. Is there a limit? <laughs> when is the next talk? All right. Um, I'm not bitching around. It's all fine. I was just wondering, I'm interested in using this for uh, lower power stuff, and uh, maybe like a, a three watt panel. And I was wondering if any of this stuff could be uh, downsized to make it a little cheaper if you're only doing low power. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, actually, the DC-DC buck converter, which is the chip right above that black dot above the coil, that can handle 1.5 amperes on its own. So you don't need the transistors and some other stuff you don't need anymore. Um, but beware the system, the microcontroller draws some power and so on and so on. So the, the, the idle current of the circuit is like 12 milliamperes, which if you only have a three watt panel, at one point becomes significant. Uh, for that type of solution that you're looking for, I would uh, make a purely analog microcontroller, uh, 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 um, uh, MPP tracker. But you want to measure, right? OK, then the microcontroller still comes in. Yeah. Then you have to live with it. Like 12 milliamperes is what you're going to spend. Or may maybe eight, because uh, some e extra components can be eliminated. All right? <laughs> so hey, I can, I can carry on. I don't know. I have no mind. As you already mentioned, we have a time limit. It ah. is reached. <laughs> so okay. Well, thanks. thank you very much.
As the next talk 